Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, June 2nd, 2016. This is the week in charts. This week's week of charts is brought to you by the Barking Squirrel, BarkingSquirrelCoffee.com. Good stuff. You should try some. Also by me, I guess I need to upgrade my graphic or update my graphic. Maybe I should say the second half of the year. It doesn't look so good so far. But this is uh, for my trading service. And just go to my homepage and go to store. And you can get it. Uh, you can start it for $47. There you go. Or you can go to that direct link. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. I always like to sum it up. All predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So this week I was thinking about what I want to talk about. And yesterday I was working on some slides for a, a beginner course. And there's three things that I'm focusing on in this beginner's course. And trying to take experience that I've had over the past 20 years or so. And then also things that I wish I'd have known like the first few years that I started. So 20 something years ago, things that I wish I would have known and put in there. And you could really boil it down to just really three things that you need to become a successful trader. I thought it'd be a good idea to talk about these things. Number one, of course, you need a viable methodology. Now this is a bit of a captain obvious statement obviously but you'd be surprised at the amount of people who wing it it's really amazing now when it comes to picking a methodology it has to be conceptually correct there has to be some sort of basis as to why it works. So the way I see it is since the only way to make money on a trade is to capture a trend, then something trend following makes a lot of sense. And this is the chart that I often use to make my case for technical analysis. If a market is going to go from A to C, it's going to have to pass through B along the way. So if it's going from 5 to 20, at some point it will have to go through 10. There's no hard and fast rule when it comes to fundamentals. But with technical analysis, there is a hard and fast rule. A market will have to go through B on its way to C. Now, unless you're trading IPOs, which I actually do have a strategy called buy at B, or unless you're trading a very wide, diverse portfolio, or you just happen to hit it right, like I talked about recently in a stock contest. If you want to try to win a stock contest, the best way you could do that is to risk a lot of money, don't use money management, and just probably the easiest way is just buy as the market makes new highs. But longer term, you can't just buy it at B, but you got to keep that in the back of your mind that you do want to buy when stocks are going up or Forex or whatever you're trading. And you do want to sell or sell short when they're going down. And then again, let's say you buy somewhere here. The only way to profit from the trade is to sell it somewhere here, higher than you bought. I know another captain obvious statement, but that is a trend from B to C is a trend. In this case, I suppose a continuation of the trend so something should be conceptually correct you can't buy because the moon is doing this or the stars are doing whatever there has to be some reasoning some logical reasoning behind it and the methodology must be repeatable meaning that you could use the same sort of patterns over and over and they'll work longer term and this is not to say it's going to work every day or all day but over time and we all know that longer term trend following as I often pointed out 
is going to be wrong about 70% of the time. I, 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 by accident, I stumbled across somebody's record on the internet while looking for something else. And they had like, oh, we made 500% or something ridiculous. I'm like, whoa, maybe they're doing something I don't know. I don't understand. Maybe I should, maybe I, should, maybe I should subscribe. And then I looked at their uh, printed, what they had printed as their record. And I noticed that their percent correct was only about 30%. So they're wrong 70% of the time. And they had a pretty serious drawdown in there too. And these things come with longer term trend following. Now, obviously, my belief is to take the hybrid approach, which we'll talk a little bit about in a few minutes. But if you're just going to be a longer term trend follower, you're going to be wrong a lot. But over time, you're going to do okay, but there's also going to be some serious drawdowns in between. So it's not necessarily a perfect way to trade. There is no perfect way to trade, by the way. So it's not going to be repeatable every day, all day, but over time. And importantly, or more importantly, when it's combined with the proper money and position management, does it allow for unlimited gains with somewhat limited losses? So the aforementioned track record I was talking about had some pretty serious drawdowns to it. So it works, but it's, it's, it's very difficult to survive those times. And we're going to talk a little bit about drawdowns in one second. But that's a little that's that's borderline a little dangerous because we all read about these famous longer term traders, these famous trend followers. But what they fail to, to point out is they subsequently blow up. Well, that's because they don't have they have the unlimited gains part figured out, but they have it kept the the losses in check, the somewhat limited losses in check. So. It's, it's kind of cliche, but obviously you need to have a plan that cuts your losses short and also lets your winners ride. Now, with your viable methodology, it has to be one that you have studied in good times and bad times and mediocre times. But you have to keep in mind that the map is not the territory. So it's pretty easy to look at something and say, wow, this is the greatest thing to sliced bread. It's a lot e it's a lot harder to actually follow it. As I think Yogi Berra, I wasn't real I didn't realize it was Yogi Berra, but as Yogi Berra once said, in theory, theory and practice are the same. Are the same but in reality they are not so you have to study what worked but more importantly study what didn't and even more importantly you have to imagine how you would feel you really have to play devil's advocate as I've said quite a bit People will send me systems. And by the way, please don't send me a system unless you send me a $5,000 deposit <laughs> because I don't want to get into system development business. It's like everyone, if you have your own twisted turds, that's fine. And you're doing your own thing, that's fine. And I admire you for doing that. And if you could take some of my stuff and, and make it better or incorporate your stuff, that's great. But I don't want to get into system design. I've spent 20 something years working on my system. And I still haven't perfected it yet. Probably never will. And that's just the trade. But people do occasionally send me systems like, okay, well, look, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a quick opinion on this, but we're not going to get the system design business. And I'll see things like a 46, 47% drawdown. It's like, geez, uh, could, you really, could you really lose half your money and keep on trading? Um Maybe if you're by yourself, you certainly could. I know there's been some some people out there, some of the aforementioned people I talked about have had tremendous drawdowns come back, tremendous drawdowns come back, and they have this flippant 
psychological makeup. And one of the guys I was watching an interview on on, on YouTube, and they're like, uh, well, you blew up. And he's like, well, yeah, but the people don't realize that my, the same – psychology which which allowed me to blow up is the same psychology which allowed me to take this these excessive risks and to create this this wealth to begin with before it evaporated so there are a few people out there could that can do these crazy things but it's going to be very hard to survive a 50 percent drawdown provided you could do it yourself if someone else is depending upon you if this gentleman's spouse was Saying, "Hey, uh, hey, Joe, I, I can't help but notice that uh, you, you just lost half of you just lost half of all our money. Um, if you're following your system, just keep following it. But um, I'm beginning to wonder about this. And then, obviously, unless you're a certain value player, who I won't mention, you can't lose over half your money and expect to still have clients if you do have clients. So, the map is not the territory." And then here's the other thing to realize. When you're creating a system, especially a mechanical system, always realize that your biggest drawdown is in front of you. Now, I hope my biggest drawdown is not in front of me. And I think that through discretion by saying, okay, we're starting to lose money here. Has, is something changing? Maybe I need to sit on my hands. Maybe need to be a, more, a little bit more selective. Let's just wait a little while and see. I can mitigate those drawdowns as opposed to following a system mechanically into a hole as, as it goes further and further. Now, I had a, a mechanical guy once. I explained to him that your biggest drawdown is always in front of you. And he backtested a lot of stuff. I don't think he ever traded. I think by the time he would get around to even thinking about trading something because he thought it was so great, he was he had already invented something new. And that's fine if, if you want to be in the system development business. But sooner or later, you have to pick something to stick to it. But anyway, we had a conversation once, and I said, well, you know, your biggest drawdown is always in front of you. And he got – he was bad. He was livid that I would say such a thing. And, and I just worry about him because I don't think he realizes that the map is not the territory. Just because he back-tested the system – doesn't mean it's going to always work that way in the future. So keep in mind that the more you backtest something, or when you backtest something, I should say, you're looking, you're looking at something that already happened. And the more complex the system is, and the more accurate it is, the more you your system has fit the curve of what has happened in the past. And a lot of people don't realize that just because something hasn't happened doesn't mean it can't. And as Tlaib points out, the black swan thing, just because you've never seen a black swan doesn't mean they don't exist. Now, after I read Tlaib's book, one day a black swan landed in my pond. And this is not the exact picture of it, but it looks much like that. I can't find the exact picture. I've been trying to find it on one of my computers somewhere. I think I might actually have a digital, a real print of it. But anyway, long story endless, out of the blue, a black swan lands in my pond. I'm like, oh, wow, look at that. Black swans do exist. So, again, just because you haven't seen it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Now, once you do have something you think that works – then you're going to have to have some experience so you know that that you could follow it and, and how you're going to react. Brian Gelber said, this is my view of a year in the life of a trader. Four out of 12 months are hot. You're so excited that you can't sleep at night. You can't wait to get to work. The next day, you're just rolling. Two months out of the year... You're cold, you're so cold, you're miserable, you can't sleep at night. You can't figure out where the next trade is going to come from. And the other six months, you just kind of grind it out, make some, lose some, make some, lose some. Me personally, when I'm hot, it makes me nervous because I know that it's going to end. And yes, I'm excited to wake up and look at the markets, but I know it's going to come to an end. When I'm cold and I can't hit the side of the market, 
in the market can't hit the side of the barn, I worry when will I come out of this? And then the rest of the time, it's like you grind it out. You're like, you make some, you lose some, you make some, you lose some. You're like, come on, come on. When's the next good run going to come? So you really need to get some experience. As I often say, and I almost put the slide in, but, I, but you guys have seen it before. It's kind of the chicken and the egg thing with the methodology and the psychology, which came first. Well, you need the methodology first, but then your psychology of following the methodology, maybe you can't follow the methodology, okay? I've met a trader before that had a system that um, he, he physically couldn't follow it, but he knew it worked for whatever reason he couldn't follow it maybe the maybe the drawdowns were a little steep or maybe it was it was uh it went against what he believed in deep down or something uh but he was convinced it was a viable methodology and he said he paid someone to follow it for him and he also said if you don't follow it you're going I'm going to fire you so that person had a different type of mindset when it comes to following the system he's like well yeah I like my job I want to make money. Let me just do what this guy tells me to do. But when you're actually following a system yourself, there's going to be good times and bad times, and there's going to be a lot of boring times, at least with my methodology. Now, this is a good problem over here, and I never really thought about it until I've seen some really crazy things happen. People get into the print money phase. The market's trending and doing really great. And I can think of one case in particular, but there's been several of them. I don't want to. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. But in one particular case, they they made twenty percent over a short period of time, and they're like. This is great, and this was easy. So I'm just going to to get rid of this business I've been working on for 20 years, and I'm just going to trade. And this was over a very short period of time. And I probably would make a lot more money if I just focused on this over here and told everybody how great it could be instead of telling everyone or trying to temper everyone's expectations. So... Making money is a good problem, don't get me wrong, but it still could be a problem nonetheless. And then one thing that I see over and over, and as I said, ad nauseum, or say ad nauseum, I should say, because pe people ask me all the time, well, Dave, what if too many people follow you on the trading service? And I was like, that's not going to happen. Well, what if? I was like, well, it's not going to happen because when things are doing going well, People start getting in early. They start taking mediocre setups. They over leverage. They, and, and I don't want to say this to be vain, but they think that they don't need me anymore and they could do their own stuff because it's everything they touch just turns to gold. And that's fine. But I've been doing this for a while and I have some experience and I can help you find those those setups, but what happens is again it goes through their head, and then they eventually blow up, or worse, or not worse. I guess blowing up would be the worst thing, but they hit a hard drawdown, and then they start searching for the holy grail. Like, okay, we hit it just right here, but they didn't realize that maybe it just was the conditions. Maybe it's just was that the conditions were conducive to the methodology, and then they go on a grail hunt. Obviously, this is the, the tough part here, too, when you're hitting that drawdown and you're losing that, that money. And I, I know of quite a few horror stories here. Um, I'll tell you some personal ones, but uh, that's a two-drink minimum, at least, before we get into all that. But we all go through these, these three phases here. And sometimes people... Obviously, bad things, really bad things happen 
even though they're doing okay, like profitable traders, even though they're profitable, they think they should be more profitable. And it might just be the conditions. And then obviously, without getting too dark on you, bad things can happen here. So you just have to embrace the fact that there's going to be good times. There's going to be bad times. And then there's going to be kind of a bit of a shoulder shrug where you're going to have to learn to just wait. Now, it's not easy following any system, but it's going to be much easier to follow a simple system. And provided it's not arcane or esoteric, complex systems can usually boil down to simpler systems. The reason I want to point out the arcane is, let's say you're counting waves, and no offense to a wave counter, but in perfect hindsight, you could count perfect waves, okay, to the market. But you try to get into the market, you try to wave count in real time, and that wave, which in perfect hindsight lasted two years, and you're one year into it trying to figure out where you are, you won't know for another year what that wave was, okay? I don't want to pick on the, the, the wave counters too much, but the only ones that I've seen who seem to be successful, and I don't have proof that they are, but who seem to be successful combine it with some sort of other trend following. And when they make money, it's because they're following the trend anyway. So my whole point is, if you're doing something arcane, it's going to look perfect in hindsight. And usually, especially if you're doing something complex, it can be boiled down to something simpler. So if you're doing something arcane, but you do have a trend following aspect to it, Maybe just focus on your trend following aspect and do the arcane thing as a hobby. Years ago, I knew someone who was doing some very arcane stuff, but his actual, but that was his hobby. In his actual trading, he was doing a lot of more simple trend following type of things. Now, with a complex system, it's going to be much harder to follow because if you have a lot of things that have to happen, you might miss your signal and then in hindsight realize, oh, dang, that was a signal. So that's going to be even more harder to follow. Now, simple systems aren't perfect, obviously, but you should try to boil down a more complex system to something simpler because that something simpler is going to work much better longer term from both a psychological standpoint of you following it and from a not curve fit standpoint as I discussed earlier and as I often say I'll, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus here but I'll often see presentations and there'll be dozens and dozens of buys and sells and buys and sells along the way and usually, just by default, somebody will have a moving average drawn on. And it's like, well, maybe just a, just a simple sort of moving average breakout or pull back to moving average system and stay with the trade as long as it stays well above the moving average would have kept you in a trade. So you'd have maybe one buy instead of 100 or whatever they have on the chart. So you got to be careful. I don't want to pick on anyone because because there's more than one way to skin a cat, and that's what makes a market. But always try to reduce something down to something that's less complex. And as I often say and have written in my column before, if you can't if you can't explain it on a cocktail napkin, and that kind of goes for life too, doesn't it? But if you can't explain your trading system on a cocktail napkin then you probably should toss it out. <laughs>
Phil says, wow, moving average for trend following. Don't tell me the 50-day moving average, perhaps. <laughs> Phil's got a fascination with that 50, and um, he does quite well with it. And, and that's There's nothing wrong with that. It makes sense. Donald says, Dave, do you agree that most traders worry way too much about entries and that the really important aspect to trading is money and position management? Uh, yes, probably. As a general statement, I would say yes. And you're, 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 you're getting a little, you're kind of getting ahead of where I was going to be in a few minutes. But, but yeah, uh, because, well, I could just think of a few people recently have, have said, well, I'm following your service. So it's like, well, why are you in 20 trades? We only have a few open positions. Well, I, I got in early on this one and uh, yeah, they're they're trying to beat the system and they're 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 obsessing with the entries. You you want to obsess with the best patterns first, obviously. But if you do obsess with the best patterns and you get in the position, a lot of people can't can't follow through once they're in the position. They either hold on too long and get stopped out. They try to outsmart things by saying, well, the trend is going far enough and they get out. Or they take a small profit or at first signs of adversity, they get out. So micromanagement is probably a big one of the biggest sins when it comes to, to trading. So I, I think as a general statement, yes, people don't focus enough on staying with the trade. They just focus on the entries, but you also need to really focus, obviously, on getting into the best markets to begin with. And then, of course, sitting on your hands when you're not in those conditions. I'm going to flesh that out in just one second, but good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Now, let's take a look at just real quick, and we'll talk a little bit about the money management here in just one second. But this is pretty much my methodology in a nutshell, and this is straight from layman's. The first thing you want is a strong trend or emerging trend. And by emerging trend, I should have said obvious emerging trend. And we'll look at one example, a live example, in a few minutes. And then we're looking for some sort of correction, a pullback to that trend. And obviously, we look at the inner if and only if it begins to resume. Now, you guys have been around for a while. Just bear with me. Uh, so if a stock begins to rally up and then it comes back in, or any other market for that matter, Forex or whatever, commodities, there's no trade. But if it does trigger, and like Donald pointed out, people are too focused on entries, um, you want to have that confirmation in there. But unless the market is, is just a, in a rip roaring trend, you certainly don't want to front run that entry. So if it does enter, you could be wrong on any trade. It doesn't matter if it's you or me or the guy who screams on TV. We can be wrong on a trade. It doesn't matter how great it looks. So we have that stop just in case. Now, as the position moves in our favor, and we'll talk a little bit about money management in a second, but we begin to kind of stair step that hot stop higher. And if we hit the initial par partial profits, we make sure we get that stop up to break even. So boring overnight gaps, the worst we could do is break even. And then should the trend continue and we go into longer term trend following mode, then we're in a beautiful position and we'll just trail that stop higher. Now we'll look at a live example and I'll walk you through it. So I just said you want a trend or an obvious emerging trend. In this case, this stock has begun to trend nicely off its lows. Percentage-wise, this is a pretty big run. doesn't look like it because of the scaling. But we did have a very, very obvious, almost textbook bow tie off of, I think it was all-time lows. So we know we have a pretty serious trend transition in place. So let's take a look at it. Here's your bow tie right there. So let's take a look at it on a clean chart. So again, we had the bow tie and then also a very persistent trend developing and a very sharp trend developing from low. So it was also a first thrust pattern. 
So we used a very liberal entry, which gave us a very liberal protective stop because the stock, S-T-O-C-K, was very volatile. Okay. And then here is the position in the spreadsheet. This was the swing trade loaf, and this was a longer term loaf. So we're trying to get that short term trade out. And we're trying to get that, ideally get that protective stop up to break even when that happens. So we're in a great position. It's it, And I have yet to come up with a better way of explaining it. But we're playing with the market's money. I used to call it grandma money management. Years ago, I lived on the Mississippi coast. And when the casinos came to town, all the little ladies would bring their 20 bucks with them or whatever. And when they were ahead, 20 bucks, if they were ahead, which probably not often the case, they'd pocket 20 bucks that they keep playing on the whatever was left in the machine on the market with the uh, with the casinos money. And I don't suggest you go gambling, especially with a slot machine. But if you are, you could probably make some money if if you get lucky, obviously, I mean, the odds are stacked against you longer term, you won't make any. But if you do get lucky one day and you keep and you have a money management plan in place, then you just just could play with the house's money. And that's the problem with using that analogy is that it, it has a gambling aspect. See, I accidentally I didn't intend on backing into the gambling aspect, but you're not gambling because what you're doing is you're taking risk off okay you put the risk on and then you're taking risk off and then you're following longer term and as i said earlier you have to have the potential for limited losses in this case two percent total and again with the caveat barring overnight gaps and then the potential of unlimited gains so you can see on the and except for this morning obviously but there was a 34% gain in the first loaf, which we're only looking for a 1% gain in the overall portfolio. So this number looks pretty impressive. And that's the numbers I think this, that whoever was publishing uh, was showing what they did with the system was earlier. They were showing these numbers like, wow, look at this, 70%. Well, yeah, but I mean, what's your contribution to the overall portfolio? And so far, this has been, at least as of last night, this is 2%. On 100k and this is one percent on 100k so again we look for that swing trade we take that off and then we follow on the remainder and by the way the secret to following on the remainder is slowly letting this stop widen out because it's in this case it wasn't that tight but you could see that the stops a lot wider up here than it was back here and I don't want to get into too much details of that because I've done plenty of presentations. And by the way, I'm getting some of the older weekend charts up on YouTube. Just bear with me. It's going to be a slow process, maybe one every day or so. But anyway, if you trade properly, you're catching two things. You're catching a trend, obviously, but you're also catching an expansion in volatility. And in this case, you're also catching a, a higher price move because prices are getting higher, obviously. So the combination of those three means that it's going to take a, a wider and wider stop in order to hang on. But that's okay. We let that stop widen out. And what you have to what, what you have to look at when you are trailing a stop higher is are you gaining ground with the stop? So every time the stock goes higher, you're gaining some ground. You're never going to get that exact top, that exact high. You just have to keep following along and see what the market is going to give you. So we already kind of talked about the money in position management, but you have to have a money in position management plan in place. Now, it's cliche, but again, you've, you have to cut your losses short and let your winners ride. You cannot trade a methodology which takes very little bitty gains and occasionally just gets creamed. Now, you could you could do that and you'll be trading a highly accurate system, but you'll have a very brilliant but brief career. The old commodity adage, you can't eat like a bird, meaning take 
small profits and shit like an elephant have huge losses. Now, trading is unfair because it doesn't matter how much you make. As I talked about those aforementioned famous traders who make all this money, but then they subsequently blow up. So they might make 10,000%, but if they lose 100%, then the game is over. So never forget that the percent to recover from a drawdown could be very tough. And it starts at 10% is a good place to begin looking at this because at a 10% loss, you have to make back 11.1% just to get the back, back, back to break even. So that's not too bad. But then it starts growing exponentially from there. And obviously at 50%, if you lose half your money, you need to make back 100% of your money. So – the aforementioned person who had this system, which had round numbers of 50% drawdown, they had to make back 100% on their system, 100% on their remaining money just to get back to break even. And then obviously it grows geometrically from there. So by the time you get to 90% loss, you've got to make like a 900% round numbers gain in your account. Aaron says, what if you took the whole profit instead of half? No. Do you think over time, several years, you might end up better and, and then taking half and hoping for longer-term gain? No. Over the short term, it, it, as I, I've said this a thousand times, and I'll say it again, when a market is doing this and it hits that initial stop, I'm sorry, initial profit target, and then stops out, Okay. And that happens repeatedly. So you're only getting that 1% that gain. Remember, we're risking 2%. We're taking profits at 1%, partial profits. And then we're hoping for some big gain afterwards. So when the market, again, is doing this over and over again, Everybody wants to say, well, Dave, why don't we take 100% here of the profit? And over that period of time, that works, okay? The problem is if you take 100% of the profit here, and oh, by the way, when the market's doing this, everybody's like, well, why don't we keep on 100%? Why don't we take 100%? Why don't we keep 100%? And you really want to try to have your cake and eat it too. But if you don't allow for this occasional longer term home runs and sooner or later, you're going to get into a trade like this and it's going to open down here on you. Then you're going to have a big loss. So now you have a big loss and it's going to take a lot, a lot, a lot of these little bitty trades to make back for that one big loss. That's why I'm not a huge fan in pure swing trading because you don't make enough. Over a short period of time, you might do really well, but sooner or later, you're going to get whacked and more than once, and then you're gonna, your recovery is going to be a lot tougher. So if you're a pure short-term trader, there's always the danger that you're going to get hit hard and not be able to make up for it. So that's why I take the hybrid approach. It's not my way of the highway, but this seems to be the secret sauce from what I can tell when it comes to trading. So you might do very well over an extended period of time with just pure short-term trading, but sooner or later something bad will happen and how will you recover? Now something bad can happen with, with a hybrid approach, but at least – if you're, you're occasionally catching that big home run, it, it pays for it all. Like uh, Ed Sakota said, one big trend pays for it all. Now, it, it does seem elusive and it does seem pretty tough, and it is. But it seems like your big winners come along just enough, just barely enough to keep you going. And I've been seeing this happen for many, many, many years. So the money management, again, 2% of every trade. The stop is going to be based on the volatility of the stock. I have two presentations out there. If you go to videos on my website, 
you could see those just on setting stops alone. So I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I also have two videos on the potential negative expectancy of taking one for one profits. And if you are, Aaron, uh, taking one for one profits, meaning that you're risking five points to make five points, then you don't have that that longer term trend following multiple to ones. Now, some people say, well, we, you know, uh, one for one, let's do three for one. OK, well, you're. Or three, yeah, three times profits for every one point you risk. Well, you're going to get stopped out three times as much with this system. OK, as if you're. Doing a one for one. Because the market is three times more likely to make a one point move or one whatever stop move than it is to make a three point move. Now, I did two videos just on beating negative expectancy alone, so I'm not going to reinvent the wheel there. But again, getting back to the cut your losses short, let your profits ride, it, it all works in with that. Whereas on that second loaf, that second half of the trade, you allow, your, allow that stop to slowly open up and you allow yourself to catch that potential home run. I know that pure longer term trading has only a 30 to 40 percent winning percentage. I would say it's lower than that. I would say it's a 28 to 32 percent, if that high. OK, what do you think the winning percentage is hybrid method? I, I don't know. I, I don't you can't really focus on the statistics too much other than generalities like we know if we're going to be a longer term trend following, we're going to be wrong about 70 percent of the time. When things are going really well. We might hit 10 in a row. We might be 100% correct. But sometimes things will be going well, and we, we hit the target stop out, hit the target stop out, hit the target stop out. Well, we might be 100% correct, but we're only making little profits. So the percent correct, I think, is irrelevant. Now, with that said, when things are going really well, both short-term and longer-term, I'll hit in about 70% range. I just know that from experience. But my point is, I would rather be less accurate and make more money than be more accurate and make less money. So, again, one big winner pays for them all. And that's the problem with following a methodology, especially if you're, like, you're following along in a trading service. Well, what happens is, and obviously everything's for educational purposes only. I'll get that disclaimer out the way. But what happens is... People sharpshoot the signals, and they miss that one important winner. And I know it could be skewed, and I was told by Peter Mothi, stop saying the word streaky, but I don't have a better word. It's sometimes it's streaky. Sometimes you print money over a short period of time. Sometimes you get a few big winners, and you must be present to win. You have to capture those few big winners. Otherwise, it's going to be mediocre at best. So I wouldn't worry so much about the percent correct. I would focus mostly on making money. There are many new IPOs this year. Does the system you showed apply as well to their very short-term trends? Yes. In fact, I did a whole course just on IPOs, which was on sale over Memorial Day. A um, little soft sell in there. And... It's the same exact methodology, but what I did was I, I, I hate, I, I, for lack of a better word, I kind of bend the rules a little bit. I have some different patterns that work better at IPOs than they do in more established issues. But every now and then, an IPO will take off too. And every now and then, an IPO will even take off over a short period of time, even though you'll stop out. It's still worth trading for both shorter term. And longer term gains. We're in one right now in TLA. We'll take that was on the um, spreadsheet earlier. If you look at it, okay. Uh, we'll get we'll get to that in one second. Uh, we'll, we'll pull that up. So again, we're taking partial profits when the risk the reward equals the initial risk. But then, 
if the trend materializes, you're still in. And if it does it, at least you made something. And that's what I call the better than the poke in the eye trade. So, again, we're trend following now in this particular issue. So we'll just have to wait and see. We don't know what this brings, but that's what a stop is for. It's nothing to do. Like Donald said earlier, what's more important, the entry or the position management? Well, with my system, you could be, unless it goes straight up right when you get in, but in general, you could be a little sloppy with the entry. But you want to be darn, make darn sure that you hang out longer term. Now, I guarantee you, most of the people who saw this original trade are probably no longer in it. Because as soon as it starts to go sideways, they get bored. They get out. Okay. As soon as they think they made enough money, oh, it's up uh, 80% here. That's, that's uh, How often do stocks go up more than 80%? Not often. Okay. Like uh, someone just pointed out, you're going to be wrong 70% of the time. It's like, well, why would you want to do that? Well, because it's worth it for the time that you're right big. And you have to make a lot of money at some point. Otherwise, the frictional cost and the losses will grind you down. So you have to position yourself for that open-ended gain. So, yeah, this is the IPO, the NTLA. Now, it's obviously get corrected today, but that's okay. Stop out, stop out. But you still want to position yourself for potentially unlimited gains, even in IPOs. So, again, this is what the money in position management looks like. You got to stop. You take partial profits, and then you get that stop up to break even once you hit the initial profit target, and then you slowly let it widen out to hopefully stay with the trend for a long, long time. And, you know, you're right. They have been a lot of IPOs, and that's, what, that's what's kind of weird. It's like I keep thinking I'm going to do an IPO trading service, but it's like this bull market is going to end sooner or later. Well, what happened this year is that, it continued. It continued with fewer and fewer setups. And the good thing is the dichotomy has been great. They're either going straight down and you just avoid them altogether or they're going up and then you go after them. But, yeah, I've been thinking about an IPO service for years. And I keep thinking that, oh, well, it's going to end someday. So it's it's I just better not even think about doing that. I'll just keep trading them on my own. And if they're liquid enough, put them in my core trading service. But each year just – so far, it just continues on. But, yeah, one day that will probably end, unfortunately. Donald says, uh, having trading a longer-term trend system in a hybrid system, I could say your system is much easier to stay with longer term. The problem with systems are you have to stay with the system, especially when you're losing money. Yeah, and that's the thing, too. Now, if you develop the system that has a 50% drawdown and backtesting, that's going to be a hard system to stay with. But if you have something that when you begin getting stopped out repeatedly and you're using a little discretion, so you say, well, wait a minute, maybe I need to back off a little bit in my trading so you can mitigate those drawdowns and your money management is in place for your initial positions, then that's a little bit easier to survive than something with the, with the drawdowns. But yeah. Provided you have a viable system, and that's the key phrase in that sentence, or viable is a key word in that sentence. If it's a viable system, then you need to keep trading it. And there are some things out there that, that have abysmal drawdowns that I can't personally trade, and I would be very nervous about trading, but the way these traders make their money is they just keep trading it into these holes and, and knowing that eventually it's, they're going to come out of the hole. But for me to wrap my head around that from, as people say, is your money management psychological or statistical? And the answer is yes. It's, it's psychological in that I, I get that small gain out. It's psychological and then I get that longer term ego, that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, whatever it is, self-actualization, self-whatever, fulfillment, fulfillment, getting that longer term trend by catching a longer term trend. 
but it's also statistical in that the trend doesn't always materialize. So get a swing trade, stop out, get a swing trade, stop out. We're not doing that for, we're, we're doing that to stay in the game, but our ultimate goal in every trade is to get that stop up to break even at least, and then hopefully follow along for a long, long time. Now, obviously, the third thing you're going to need is a proper mindset. The greatest methodology in the world is useless if you don't have the proper mindset to follow it. As I told the story a thousand times when bragging to my system about – bragging to my system – bragging to my wife about my latest system back in my, my days when I was doing a lot of programming, she's like, how many systems do you really need? And it's like, you need one, the one that you're going to follow. So – like I said last week, and this I thought this was a good uh, slide to leave in from last week, and I spent a lot of time talking about psychology, so I just thought I'd kind of wrap it up, the, the psychology part, just by saying there's a lot of emotional people out there that make up a market. The market is made up of a lot of emotional people. That's what makes a market. And one of those is you. If you boil down technical analysis, at least my definition of it, it's, it's using charts to read the mindset of the market, to read the emotions of the participants while embracing your own. So I often say that, as I said last week, just embrace how you feel and embrace your frustrations and things you may be tempted to do and then realize that there's thousands of other people that are making up the market doing the same exact thing. So another cliche thing is plan your trade and trade your plan. I cannot emphasize that enough. As I say ad nauseum, you need to obsess before you get into a trade, not afterwards. And that's why I spent 14 hours in a course talking about how to pick the best stocks. So when you're looking at a possible stock or some other market, but let's just focus on stocks, is the stock trending or an emerging trend? Is the sector trending? Are the stocks within the sector trending? Is the overall market trending? Is the stock not only trending, but if it's a trend resumption type of setup, is the trend also accelerating? Does the stock trade cleanly? Does it, or does it look like a ledger cardiogram? And then we're going to talk about net net change in a little while, but never forget to look at the net net change. I get emails all the time from people. Dave, what do you think about the stock? Well, it's gone sideways for eight weeks. Yeah, but it's had a pretty good run. Earlier this year, it's like, yeah, I hear you, but is it losing momentum or gaining momentum? So obsess over all these things before you get in to the trade. And as I often say, you want to plan while things are static, while the market's closed. Because when condition is uncertain or changing, as I think it was Montier said, that's when stress begins to come in. If you have to make a lot of uh, seat of the pants decisions, you're going to create stress for yourself. But if you have a plan and you're going to follow that plan, then again, as I often say, trading can be quite boring. But most people don't follow their plan. They'd rather wing it. The moment you put a plan into place is the moment that you admit you could be wrong. And it's also, at least with the trend following methodology, you're admitting that you don't know how long that trend will go. So you're kind of having to give up your ego. So it kind of sound like uh, Jesse, uh, Jesse Jackson or Al Sharpton. You know, it's like uh, you don't know how far the trend will go. So you have to give up your ego. So and just follow along. So you need to obsess before you get into a trade, not afterwards. But so many people. Don't follow the plan. And then once they get into the trade, Dave, what should I do? Well, where's your stop? <laughs> the market was up today. This stock didn't go up. What's wrong? Uh, pff, I don't know. Well, should I get out? Well, where's your stop? Did your stop get hit? Yes. Then get out. Did your stop get hit? No. Then stay in. 
I know. It's a lot easier said than done. But as Donald alluded to earlier, people focus too much or, or, or don't focus enough on staying with the trade. And they're just, they're just focusing on getting into the trade. So here's the thing. I do have some good news. If you are struggling, by the way, it never fully goes away. As I often admit, I cuss, I fuss, I get, I get a little depressed sometimes with markets. I get a little, uh, my head gets a little big sometimes, okay? Sometimes all within the same hour. Sometimes I watch screens too much. So we're all emotional beings. I mean, I cry like a schoolgirl in Nicholas Smart, Sparks movie, you know? <laughs> I'm just very emotional kind of guy and both ups and downs. So it never fully goes away. We all have a pulse. And by the way, as I often preach, you cannot make a decision without emotions. So emotions cannot be eliminated from trading. Computers don't have emotions and they can't, they can't trade on their own. Okay. If, if you could eliminate the emotions, then whoever, had the best computers could be the best traders, but you have to embrace them. Now, provided, of course, I do have some good news, and that's provided, of course, you have done the things that I've said today. Carefully studied a viable methodology and have experienced a variety of conditions, and you had that solid money management plan in place. Then the good news is I'd be willing to bet that I know or you know, I'm sorry, you know what you're doing wrong. And as Livermore said, and again, I've, this is one of my favorite slides. You've probably seen it a few times. A stock speculator sometimes makes mistakes and knows that he is making them. I wrote a whole article on this, and it was uh, published in Traders Magazine. I think it was published in uh, several different languages. It was one of the more popular ones. And I don't, uh, I'll have to see if I have the, the link. It might be on the free reports on my website. If it's not there, uh, let me know, remind me, I should say, and I'll see if I could dig it up for you. But it's like I've said before, and I said in the stocks and commodities interview, I think recently, it's like I'll, when I work with someone, I'm like, I, I get a little stressed out. Like, how am I going to figure this guy out? Well, I'm going to figure out what they're doing wrong. And usually I ask them, and then they tell me. And then in a few cases, when they don't tell me, I can figure it out pretty quickly just by looking at what they're doing. And as I often say, I know I, I, I need some new stories, but in one case in particular, it's like following along with the service. I can't make any money. I'm quitting. Well, let's look at your trades. And it's like, well, why do you have these these 20 trades over here? It's like you would have made a little bit of money on these. And you did make a little bit of money on these five trades that were in the service. Not much, but a little. But then you lost this tremendous amount of money over here on these day trades, these 20-something day trades that you took. And the reply was, I know, I know. So you know what you're doing wrong most of the times. And if you don't know what you're doing wrong, that's okay. That's Maybe that's even better because you won't allow that psychological damage to manifest. Well, freshman psychology, we're in its ugly head. If you don't know what you're doing wrong, that's okay. Get educated. Stop trading. Don't lose another dime in the markets, okay? Or worse, have the market get lucky and make money and think that it's it's you and have that psychological damage occur or manifest. If you don't know what you're doing wrong, stop. Study a methodology. It doesn't have to be mine, but obviously... I'm a big advocate of it. Instead of losing that next thousand bucks in the market, I'll make you a deal on a stock selection course. Pick better stocks. Learn how to pick better stocks. Don't just willy-nilly buy an IPO. Learn which IPOs you should be trading. So get educated. And you don't have to spend any money if you don't want. That's fine with me. Follow along on my delayed service for a while until you get a feel for things. I've had people that follow along for six months and call me up. It's like, okay, Dave, I think it's time. I, I get it. I know how it works. I understand it. So if you if you don't know what you're doing wrong, 
stop, go back to studying the methodology, go back to understanding the money management, and then when you come back to trading, you'll know what you're doing wrong, and it'll be a little bit easier to fix as opposed to letting those problems manifest. I know, freshman psychology really rearing its ugly head. One thing, not to, not to make a pun, but one thing you'll notice is when I talk about, I can't talk about one of these things without the other. They're all intertwined. And that's why I think the, the cord, the three-stranded cord makes so much sense. And the beauty is, as I often say, if you get better at one, you get better at all. If your stock selection improves, then what's going to happen? You're going to have more winners. So you're going to feel better about the methodology. You're going to be more inclined to follow it. You will know what a winner looks like. When the occasional and inevitable loser comes along, what are you going to do? You're going to kick it out because you know what a winner looks like. So now you have the mindset or an improving mindset to continue to follow the methodology, which means that you must have the money management. And as was written in Ecclesiastes, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. So again, one cannot exist without the other. Mind, money management, and the methodology. Now, as I wrote last week, the good news is, or the continued good news is, common sense is your best ally. Are you taking mediocre setups? Is it truly intuition, or could it be a little bit of intuition? Okay. And I stole that from Market Wizards, I think. Is the market itself mediocre? One thing that amazes me, it's kind of like Bollinger said, when you, when you reach the beginning you realize the true enlightenment comes, which was um, from Tolstoy. I think uh, we should never cease. What is? How does it go? We should never cease from exploring, and in the end, we realize we reach the beginning. Something along those lines. But one thing that amazes me is, the longer I'm at this, the 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 more I have simplified and simplified and simplified. I even bought the domain. And uh, trademark, trading simplified. I had that trademarked because that's what I truly believe. And it's, it's just one thing that just that I'm just blown away with is how important the debt debt change is. Is the big blue arrow pointing sideways? So as I said last week, is the market higher than it was? Is the market lower than it was? Or is the market about the same? Dave, you're talking days, weeks, months, years. Yes. Okay. And draw that line backwards in time. So let's take a look at the P's real quick, and then we'll, we'll hop out to the market in one second. You guys want to start asking about individual stocks? Start now, and then we'll get to those in just one second. Now, one thing that I've noticed, and it doesn't take a rocket surge to see, is that the indices, the overall market, has been choppy. It has looked a lot like that electrocardiogram that I often talk about. The other big thing to remember is the net-net. Where is the market? 2,100, round numbers. Where was the market at the beginning of 2016? 2,100. Where was the market at late 2015? 14, okay, 2100. So just connect that line going back in time, and you'll see that the market, oops, the market hasn't made a whole lot of forward progress in a long, long time. So draw your arrows. Now, the S&P 500, we still have some resistance to overcome. Somebody was asking me yesterday, but Dave, the more every time we push into that resistance, does it weaken it? And the, the answer is yes. I read it in a book somewhere. I don't know which one, but one of my early books I read many, many years ago, it said they see a support level or a resistance level as kind of like an army front. And every time that, that front is attacked, it gets a little weaker. 
And the reason being is that let's say somebody bought stocks here and then the market got back to here. Well, they decide to get out. So that player is no longer in the system. Okay. And then let's say in this recent push higher, a few other people said, Oh, well, you know, I'm going to go ahead and get out because I don't know that the stock thing is not working out so good. So the more you push into the resistance, the, the less important the resistance is. The problem is, and I've seen people that try to quantify this, and I, you know, God bless them for trying to do it, but I think it's impossible to to try to time something like that. Just pay attention. Is the market going up, down, or sideways? And I think that's really all you have to do. But a lot of people are trying to figure out how many times it's going to push into it, how many before it breaks out, or whatever. Just just follow is what you all you have to do. Be a trend follower. So the P's have improved shorter term, but they are bumping up against a little short term resistance at prior highs. And then there's some longer term resistance, as we just said. I just said, I should say. The NASDAQ has had a pretty good run as of late, but it only puts us back to where we were in late March or April. And then again, net net basis, let's draw the let's draw the line sideways, best I could draw it. You can go all the way back to 2014. You can see we haven't made a whole lot of forward progress. And again, even more so here, you have a lot of overhead supply to deal with. There's nothing magical about overhead supply. It's just where some trading occurred and where people might be looking to get out of break even. Russell 2000 has a pretty good run. Shorter term, it's overbought due to correct. We're not going to try to trade off of that. We just know to brace for it. Bumping up against its old high in here or its August high. Should say, oh, August high. Uh, April high, but then again, you draw that line going all the way back to 2013 here, and there was a lot of trading that happened above the market. So the more trading you have, the longer it is, the more trading you have, the more important that range becomes. If it's just a short little range, then the market can get right through it. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and hop into the... Uh, Charts. I don't think I have anything new to announce. I'm still rolling out the website. Uh, Fast Track Special has actually ended, so that's uh, we're done with that for now. And I don't have any uh, anything new in mind. But uh, if you are interested in a combination or a bundle on something, just let me know, and I'll. Uh, I'm a pretty reasonable guy. I'll make you a good deal. Okay. Rick wants to know about Zeus. That's going to be a metals and mining stock. Oh, before we do that, let me just, uh, we already talked about the market. Let's just take a quick look at, uh, there's not a whole lot to flesh out in the sectors. Some of them have pushed towards their old highs, but they've still got to get there. Still have to get there, I should say, in case my wife is listening. Um, some of them, like real estate, have retraced back up, but I wouldn't get too excited just yet unless they could make new highs. Uh, some areas like the semiconductors have been on a tear as of late, but you kind of have to see the forest for the trees here, and they still have a lot of overhead supply to deal with. So with the overall market, kind of looks like electrocardiogram. It's kind of hard for me to get too excited about stocks in general. Energies have kind of just been consolidating in here. I would like to see them make new highs. Longer term, they're still an uptrend, but shorter term, they've lost a lot of momentum. This is especially true for metals and mining. Still like the metals and mining, but they've lost a lot of momentum, and they've also pulled back to the past breakout level here. Longer term, if you back the chart way, way out, they still look like they could be in the early phases of a new bull market. But short to intermediate term, they've lost a lot of steam. So that's this is why the only two sectors that I really kind of like this year for the most part, other than some of these speculative IPOs, has been the commodity-related stocks, and then they're losing some steam in here too. And this is why you haven't seen me recommend a whole lot of stocks or get too excited lately. And the waiting is the hardest part. All right, let's take a look at Zeus, Z-E-U-S, Zeus. Okay, um, this is a little bit on the thin side, only 100,000 shares on average traded. And change, I guess, 125,000, 126,000. As a private trader, you could trade a stock like this because it is trading in the 20s, but it's a little bit on the thin side. Now, it's a little wide and loose longer term, 
and that's got me a little concerned. And then the other thing that I'm kind of seeing here is kind of jumping out at me. It does have quite a bit of overhead supply. So let's zoom in on it closer. Shorter term, it's in a range. For me to get excited about this stock, it would have to break out to new highs and then look to play the pullback, uh, Rick, on that. But again, some overhead supply to deal with. So I would pass on this one for those uh, for those reasons. COTV, Rodano. Uh, let's count it up. One, two, three, four, five. Well, what's the rule with IPOs? We can't trade them or we don't trade them until they've been out for at least five days. But yeah, that could be worth uh, putting on your radar or should be on your radar. ETE for a different Don. Uh, this is going to be an energy stock, obviously. And you can see it just kind of retraced back up to its old highs. If you're long for some reason, then stay long. It does look like the mother of all bottoms, okay? But it's not set up. Like most energies to set up again, what's what's going to have to do? It's going to have to break out to new highs from the little bases and then pull back. So I would wait for the next breakout pullback there. Site, S-I-T-E, a site a good example. A good example. You talk about IPOs. Well, this one caught my eye, and I like this one, and it's almost a textbook IPO example, except for one thing, and this is this is something we talked a lot about in the course. Notice that it only ran up three points. That's not that big of a run for an IPO. IPO needs to be needs to have some excitement to it. It needs to have some range. Three points on a 20-something dollar stock that's an IPO is really not that big of a deal. Now, scaling aside, it looks pretty good. That's your first pullback pattern, which could be a wonderful pattern to trade, which would have triggered this morning. Um, I looked at this one. This one keeps, every time I flip through my charts, this one jumps out at me until I look at the scaling. So based on the scaling, I would not take this, stock what i would do is let's see if he can he can make new highs and stay there now i'll trade anything i don't care what sector it's in but with ipos as a general statement i do like something that can be exciting there okay like um like a biotech or some sort of uh, alternate energy or it it seems like you need some kind of excitement to fuel the fire in a case like this, I'm just going off the name, Site 1 Landscape Supply. I don't know. Can Is the landscape supply business that great? And, Dave, are you confusing the issue with facts by using the F word? No, I'm not saying fundamentals, but I'm just saying that, as I said at a course, what's the story, fad or glory? Okay, Could, is, could it be some sort of fad? Like, could be a fashion fad, even a food fad, but I'm not sure that a landscape supply company can be that exciting as an IPO. Now, if the pattern was there, then close your eyes and take it. But because of the scaling, it really hasn't gone that far. With an IPO, there are, uh, what, do I, what do I call, I forget, first patterns, first tier patterns, and then there are secondary patterns. So if it doesn't really fit the mold for that first, I guess let's call it first run patterns, then wait for a secondary pattern. So in a case like this, I would wait for a secondary pattern. That one we looked at a few minutes ago, COTV, maybe a, a first run pattern might be the way to go. CPB as a short, that's Campbell Soup, I think. Is it? Yeah, Campbell Soup. Uh... Yeah, I can't really argue with that. That's kind of a, a, a go-go, no-mo type of situation. Um, I like shorting stocks with fundamentals. I like buying stocks that don't have fundamentals. I don't necessarily incorporate them into my system, though. But if you ask me if I had to use them, then yeah. Uh, I think the stock's in trouble. Volatility is pretty low on it, okay? And... It could probably come down to the mid-50s or whatever. So it, it, I think it's okay as a trade. So good eye on that, James. It's just not exciting me too much, okay? Dono, I like that one. I'm actually watching that one for a pullback. ACIA. 
Uh, now that's a pretty good run, okay? Now what do they do? Computer hardware, well maybe that's kind of exciting. That's certainly more exciting than a landscape company. And you can see I've got some stuff drawn in here. Had a nice little breakout pattern back here. And so yeah, on a pullback, and this is not enough pullback yet, check back often on that one. But yeah, I'm watching that. A few of my clients email me on that. We're all watching it. Okay, we talked about that one. HCA for T. Murphy. Let's see. Okay. All right. Um, you want to short it or go long? You got this crazy bar back here. I think that was some sort of flash crash action maybe. Um, it's not coming off of all-time highs for a short, so I just would prefer, at least at this juncture, the market is near all-time highs, especially like the S&P 500. So I'd prefer to short stocks that are coming off all-time highs. Um, and then what's the net net on this? It's 78. Let's go back in time. You know, what did I just preach? Never forget about the net net uh, trade, just to, not to beat you up. I just want to use this as a good example. So it hasn't done anything in three months or two and a half months. So in a case like this, you might want to uh, – Sit on hands. Yeah, I wouldn't short it. I, I think you could find some at, at higher uh, levels. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. John says, uh, T.S. Eliot. I think I said Tolstoy. I'm such an idiot. Uh, we shall not cease from exploration, and in the end of all exploring, be, we will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. And that's kind of where I am in markets right now. And I know I'm getting out there, but it seems like I've had this epiphany over the last few years. And, you know, talk to me. Talk to me next time I hit a, sh a really shitty drawdown and see if I'm as philosophical. But as a general statement, it seems like I've kind of reached a place where I know I, I I know I don't know. Okay, it's kind of like uh, like Socrates said in Bill and Ted's Adventure. You know, you know that you don't know, and and, and that's a wonderful place to be. And once you embrace that and live with it and just keep it simple, your life gets a lot easier. But, yeah, I'm actually kind of having fun with it now. I know. Wait till the next drawdown. QHC for Howard. Never heard of it. Oh, it's IP. That's why. Um, well, now we're looking for – this is – uh, you're kind of in secondary mode here. There is a little bit of a breakout characteristic uh, to it. It does fit that. So, yeah, if it broke out to new highs, it might be worth a trade. I do see what you're saying. Um, but – you probably, as a general statement, you, it lets you know that unless you're trading that IPO breakout you probably, pattern, you probably want to wait for it to break out decisively and then play the first pullback. So, yeah, let it break out, play the full, first pullback unless you're um, following along with the breakout pattern, which I'm not going to get into. CLDX for Don, that's probably be wide and loose. Oops. Where'd it go? Oh, there it is. All right, let's check the net net. Uh, well, let's draw an arrow. Oops. Um, that's sideways. MU. That's going to be a big one. That's a big, thick stock. Um. It's had a good run in here, but now it's pushing into overhead supply. And it's a pretty big, thick stock. And then you got big gaps and stuff in it. So I, I hear you. It's improved over the short term. I think I would leave it, leave it alone. GBT. GBT for Mr. Rick. Welcome aboard, Rick. Rick's a new client. Uh, yeah, it looks good. Uh, I want a pullback, though. Obviously, it's breaking out the new highs. On a pullback, you do have some overhead supply to deal with it here, but that's a, that's a, eh, it's a hundred percent away. So if it pulled back and ran up a hundred percent, I'd be happy. The ZB thirty-year bond. We'll take a look at. Uh, we'll do uh, TLT. Um, I don't know if I have ZB in my system on this system at least. Thirty-year uh, bond. Notice I've got a sideways arrow in here. Uh, as we've been saying throughout the presentation, look at your sideways action. So 
three months, four months, four months sideways action. So um, there's not a trade here. So I would leave it alone. Certainly keep an eye on bonds. When they begin to fall, obviously rates are going up. MGT, MGT, MG, never heard of it. That's going to be one of those thin Andre stocks. No, it's pretty thick. Yeah, really thick. Um, well, this is what I call a bottle rocket. It went up, what, 500% or something stupid. Well, that's 1,000% plus another 200%, whatever. So it went up a thousand percent and came back in. When stocks take off and go straight up like this, usually they come straight back down and they're just too dangerous to trade. So I would leave that alone. Arsene wants to know about Veef. Veef looks pretty good uh, on a pullback. Now, what did we talk about earlier? What do you want a stock to have? You want it to trade cleanly, longer term, not so cleanly. Okay, I'll give it that. But personalities can change. And what's happened in more recent times? Well, it's kind of worked its way higher. Nothing to get excited about there. Then it starts persisting higher, and now it starts to accelerate higher. So, yeah, on a pullback, I think it might be worthwhile. When rates go up, bonds go up too? No, it's an inverse relationship. When bonds go down, rates go up. I hope I didn't say that wrong. So if bonds begin to drop, that means the yield goes up on them, okay? So this is a falling interest rate environment. This is a rising interest rate environment. And then this is a stable interest rate environment. MITK for Sam. MITK. Uh, it's a trend knockout, but it's a little bit too extreme because it's, it's knocked out all the way back to its near breakout point. So I would leave it alone. But, yeah, I mean, if it came all the way back to nine tomorrow and triggered, it'd probably be worthwhile as a trade. But I would I would pass on it based on that. USO, you read my mind, Rick. I want to look at USO, and I want to bring up the dollar, too, before I forget. Uh, oil is creeping its way higher. And, you know, what, what's, what I like about oil now is not that I would necessarily factor it in to my analysis, but I like the way that people are beginning to poo-poo oil and say why oil shouldn't be higher. Oh, there's tankers that are just floating out to sea. There's so much oil. There's so much oil. Um, so I think that's probably a good thing. Uh, the ascent has slowed a little bit, but maybe it's just catching its breath. Commodities are a little bit tougher to trade than individual stocks, but we did have the bow tie way back here. Uh, let's take a look at a weekly basis. On a weekly basis, it's starting to really shape up nicely. Um, if we get a weekly bow tie in oil, that could be a really good thing uh, because you could have some pretty serious trends that hap happen afterwards. Obviously, oil, we had a weekly bow tie, what, 2008 or whatever, when right around the time everybody said oil was going to $200 a share. No, it won't, Danny. <laughs> SDLP, SDLP. Um, this one caught my eye recently. But then it's going kind of sideways in here. So now I'm kind of back to it's going to have to break out to new at least multi-month highs and then pull back. But I hear you. It's kind of a Darvis type of thing. Uh, but I would wait for the next uh, setup there. But, yeah, this one was on my list for a while. You do have some overhead supply to deal with, but it's about 100% away. So I guess that's a good problem to have. Okay, Phil wants to know about NTLA uh, as an add-on trade. This is a, this is a stock that we are we're along, and to answer your question is, uh, I'd almost like to see a little bit more knockout move. Let's see where it ends by the end of the day and tonight. I'll I'll talk about it in the service. But yeah, it is beginning to set up kind of like that TKO. Uh, I guess the answer, the quick answer is yes. But check back tonight on whether or not that's enough knockout move. But yeah, we are along this one as you saw earlier in the portfolio. So far, it's recovering today too. So so far, so good on that one. Uh, yeah, Phil, check back tonight. Let's see where we are on that. Okay, M, second wave to short. That's going to be Macy's. Uh, the problem with Macy's is it's uh, it's already emaciated. 
uh, with the shorts, like I said earlier, I just like to see them coming off of all-time highs, at least when the market is at all-time highs. Now, once you get into a longer-term downtrend, then you're then you're going to trade these trend resumption type patterns. Okay, I've got a lot. I'm going to have to get in a lightning round. Boy, I know Chief Orman really wound up today. MRUS. Uh, no, see, here's a case in IPOs, as I talked about earlier and in the course, where if they don't go up, don't buy them. And so far, this, this one's going down, so wait for it to go up. Okay. QRVO. QRVO. Uh, yeah, that looks good as something that needs to possibly be in a watch list. Eh, maybe not. Uh, no, I don't like this big – I know this gap was a long time ago. It's kind of wide and loose. Uh, it is making new highs. I hear you. But there's just not a whole lot for me to get excited right now uh, about. So I would, I, don't, I think I'd leave it alone. CD, it's going to be a, a silver stock. Uh, at first glance, this looks pretty good. But if you zoom it in a little bit, we've lost some steam. And this is why uh, if you're on a trading service, you'll notice I've, I've put a few of these metals in there. But I'm suggesting that we don't go after them because they've been a little sideways as of late. Uh, but I would certainly keep them, continue to keep them on your, on your radar, but they're just not ready to go. Fur short. Uh, no, see, it's, see, that's another case of it's, it's already, uh, it's already been skinned. Okay. So try to find something at high levels. SFBS for Mr. John. Hey, John. SF, a lot of friendlies in here today. That's good. I always like new people, but friendlies are nice too. I'll take them. Maybe on a pullback, uh, kind of hard for me to get excited about banks, but who knows? Stranger things have happened. Hey, there you are, Susan. Haven't seen you in a while. Welcome aboard. K-H-E, or welcome to the show, I should say. As a short, yeah, I, I might be able to buy that for a dollar. Uh, the only problem is you're shorting at low levels relative. Again, I think the high-level shorts are the way to go at this juncture. So at first glance, I really liked it. I hear where you're coming from. Nice little bow tie, nice little pullback. And then that would have triggered today. And, and that's okay for a swing trade, but for a longer term trade or a swing trade that you want to turn into a longer term trade, I just prefer the ones coming off of high levels. Site for Mr. Jim. Uh, yeah, we talked about this one. I'm sorry. Uh, PRTS. PRTS. Yeah, a nice little breakout, uh, maybe on a pullback. Uh, super thin, though, way too thin to be trading. But, yeah, on a pullback, I hear what you're saying. But, yeah, too trend, too uh, too thin. You want to be really careful. QHC, we talked about that one. QHC. It's a hospital. It's pretty thin. I mean, look at that. Uh, eh, well, 150000 yeah, uh, let it break out to do highs. It didn't play a pullback unless you're playing a breakout on that. As I said earlier, I think we talked about that. Okay. AXTI. Uh, no, remember we talked about this one a few weeks ago. It's just a one, it's thin, especially given it's priced. You get this big wide range bar higher. And then it's kind of, albeit, fairly seriously but it's kind of in a drift mode no that's not a, that's not something that i would uh, even consider i know that we have like three donalds in here today cdxc cdxc um too thin and it's it has broken out and rallied out of its pullback a little bit in here but it's also too many days of the pullback to consider as a new trade so i would i'd leave that one alone for now NGVT. Yeah, this is an IPO. Uh, for next pullback, it might be okay. Wait for a pullback. Watch the volume on these two. Volume's tricky in IPOs. Not enough time to get into that today. All right. WPZ, been long. PZ. Yeah, it's a, if you're long, stay long. Uh, for me to get excited about it, it would have to accelerate higher and then look to play a pullback. Uh, it does have some overhead supply to deal with. That's a ways away. I wouldn't get too excited just yet. We're right on the cusp of end of time. AXTI, did we talk about that one? 
yeah, we talked about that one. AKG, last one. Yeah, this is worth putting on your radar. But as you can see, it's going mostly sideways in here as of late. So I probably, it would probably have to break out to new highs and then look to pull back. And then I'd probably uh, go for it then. Well, look, we're out of time. Uh, geez, I'm humbled by everybody here. I appreciate you guys uh, showing up and girls. I'm really humbled that you guys would come listen to me. So thank you so much. Uh, as you can tell, this is a highlight of my week. I love these shows. So as long as you guys and girls keep showing up, I'm going to keep doing them. So thank you so much. Uh, any unanswered questions, daviddavelandry.com. If not, everyone have a great weekend, and I guess we'll talk again. Uh, I'll see you again next week. Thank you so much. I appreciate your participation. Thank you.